Hi everybody. Earlier, we learned about counting sort, one of the fastest sorting algorithms out there for sorting positive numbers. It runs at average in linear time. Now, counting sort does have a drawback. When the range of numbers you're sorting, the range between your smallest number and your largest number is very large, counting sort can be very slow, which might even make it one of the slower algorithms out there depending on the input you're dealing with. To address some of this, you have radix sort. Radix sort builds upon the, the speed and memory efficiency of counting sort, but it doesn't carry with it some of the negative side effects that counting sort also provides. So in this video, let's dive into radix sort, learn about what makes it awesome and how we can use it to build and optimize some of the sorting situations we'll be running into as part of our everyday lives. So let's start with an example to highlight how radix sort and counting sort are gonna be very different. Let's say we're sorting only two numbers. The two numbers are one, and 1 million. And so if we use counting sort to sort these two numbers, we will have intermediate arrays. And these intermediate arrays will be really, really large because the smallest number is one, the largest number is 1 million. And so we'd have an array whose size is encompassing every single value between one and 1 million because the index positions need to be the values themselves that you're trying to store, which means you're gonna have a really, really large array for only two items. And you can imagine that for sorting two items whose array size in between is around a million is not very efficient. And this is where radix sort really comes in. It's similar to counting sort in that it too is a non-comparative sorting algorithm. There's gonna be no comparisons of which value is greater than or less than another value, but it does sort values in a more efficient way. And we'll learn more about how it does that without having to create these massive intermediate arrays. Now, before I go further to learn more about data structures and algorithms like radix sort, check out my best-selling book, Algorithms, Up to the Beginner's Guide, available in physical bookstores and virtual bookstores and digital and paperback editions. So definitely check that out. Now, getting back to what we're doing here. To understand how radix sort works, let's start with an example. Here I have our input array. It has about one, two, three, seven numbers, 143, 2310, 67, 512, 99, 104. Unsorted numbers, all positive integers, and let's see how we can use radix sort to sort them. The first step is we need to find the maximum value. This is a common theme you'll see also with counting sort as well. So the largest value in our current input is 2310. It is the largest number. Now, the next step, now that we found our maximum value, is we count the number of digits in this. So what we're dealing with right now are base 10 numbers, numbers that go from zero to nine. And if you use that particular model, the least significant digit is going to be the ones digit on the rightmost side. Then it's the tens digit, the hundredth digit, and the thousandth digit. And we only have four numbers here. So the thousandth digit is going to be the largest digit that we have here. But the important detail is there are four digits in this particular one. And if you had a smaller number, it'd be three digits, two digits, or even one digit for a number between zero and nine. But for 2310, it's four digits. Now, let's walk through the overall chain algorithm and then look at an example that puts all of these steps into practice. So the first step is to find the maximum number of digits in the largest number that needs to be sorted. So we just did that. 2310 is the maximum number and the number of digits in it is, of course, four. Next step, we start with the least significant digit, the rightmost digit, which in our case would be the ones digit, and sort the numbers based on that particular digit. Now, this may sound a little bit confusing, but as we walk through the example, all of these words will be much clearer. Step three, we move to the next digit place. You know, if you just did the ones digit, we go to the tens, if you were the tens, we go to the hundreds, and sort the array based on that digit while maintaining the order from the previous step. And the last step is we repeat this process until we have sorted based on the most significant digit, the leftmost digit. And this digit would correspond to the highest digit we found in step two. So first, let's start with the, the steps. Sort the ones digit. In our current array, the ones digit would be the rightmost value. So the zero and 100, the three and 43, the zero and 2010, the seven and 67, and, and so on. And so if we sort our array based only on that digit, here's what we're gonna see. We are sorting the array on the ones digit, and now the output is 100, 2310, 512, 43, 104, 67, and 99. And if you look at, you know, if you ignore all the numbers and only look at the, the rightmost digit, you'll see that the sorting array is correct. You have zero, zero, two, three, four, seven, and nine. That seems pretty sorted to me. So next step. We move over to the left by one more space 
and now we're sorting by the tens digit, which means again the 0 and 100, the 1 in 2010, 1 in 512, and so on. So we kind of put our blinders on and only look at the, the second, the, the, the tens digit, and we sort the values by that. The output array is now going to be 100, 104, 2010, 512, 43, 67, 99. And you know, if you look at it, so like, you know, the the tens digit number in the sorted array is zero zero one one four six and nine, which is of course also sorted. Now the part to notice is that the overall array is not sorted. You know, there's no planet where you know two thousand three and ten is you know the largest number. It's going to be in position three or position two if you use the index number in our array. That's not how it is going to be done, but you, know, you have to keep following the process to see how this slowly gets in the right space. Now we start by the hundredth digit, which is the tenth digit. We now start by the hundredth digit. And this again would be the, the third most, you know, third, you know, least significant space from the right. And so it'll be the one in 100, one in 104, the three in 2,310, five in 512. Now for 43, 67, and 99, they do not have a hundred digit. You know, their their largest number is going to be in the tens. And so what we do in these cases is imagine that there's a zero there. So we just leave it blank, but we imagine that it happens to be a zero. And so when we sort with that particular you know mindset, you'll notice that the 43, 67, and 99, which are you know virtual zeros in there, they are now become the first numbers that show up in our semi-sorted array. And then we sort again by the hundred digit. So the one, one, three, five are now the values. And so you can start to see that the, our final sorted array is starting to get more evolved into what will be its final step. And the last step is, of course, because the largest number is 2,310 and there are four digits to it, we also have a thousand digit that we need to sort by. And in this case, the only number with a thousand digit is 2,310 and its value is two. And so if we were to sort by that, all the other numbers have leading zeros in front of them. Those just carry down as they are already. And the last value is of course two. So it's a, it's a C of zero values and then a two. And so naturally the second value becomes, I mean the two value, you know, ends up being the, the largest value here. And then the final order is now maintained. Now, the next step would really be to sort by the next significant digit, but there isn't one anymore because the largest value is 2,310, which means there are only four digits. So there is no fifth or sixth, you know, values for us to go through, which means we're done sorting. In which case, if we look at the array that we have here, the final output is in fact a sorted array. You can see it's 43, 67, 99, 100, 104, 512, 2010. The numbers are increasing from smallest to largest, from left to right. So we have our sorted array. Now, there's an important detail though that we kind of need to revisit. How do we actually do the sorting at each digit position? You know, we were pretty confidently going from, you know, starting by the ones digit, the tenth digit, and so on, but we did it mentally and we, you know, vocalized how it needs to be sorted, but our computers aren't like that. They need some logical steps on how to do this. The way that sorting is done, it's using our old friend counting sort. So even though radix sort builds upon counting sort, you know, in its optimizations in many ways, it ultimately uses counting sort as a subroutine to sort the intermediate values in each digit that we are dealing with. And you're like, wait, that, how does that work? You know, that counting sort has problems. It does, but the problems in counting sort, as we'll talk about in a few moments, are avoided when you're dealing with radix sort because the range of numbers you're sorting are always going to be between zero and nine because we're in a base 10, no, we're sorting decimals, base 10 values. And so the intermediate count array you're always going to be dealing with will always be between zero and nine. And if you're sorting a different base of numbers, the intermediate value will of course be different, but it won't be the, the infinite range from smallest to largest. If you have an array with like a wide range of values, it's always going to be constrained to the number of digits that your particular base will ultimately be having. So we have to walk through how that would work. Let's say we're sorting by the ones digit. And of course we're using counting sort to make that happen. We do the traditional setup of how counting sort works. We have our input array, we have our count array and an output array. And what we would do is do the typical counting of making sure the value matches the index position we're caring about. So in this case, there are two values of zero. So the count value is two. So we're incrementing the count value by two. And if you go through the array, you have two, and you have like, you know, two values of zero, one value of two, one value of three, and we point to the appro appropriate value that's causing that. Then we do the cumulative sum or prefix sum, again, 
traditional counting sort 101, and then we place the values in the output array based on what we calculated in the prefix sum value earlier. So we sort all the everything by one, you get 100, 2310, 512, 43, 104, 67, and 99. And so this is how we sorted by one. And you can imagine this exact process repeats for every digit in our input in, 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 the, in, in each digit is available as the largest value in our input. And so this makes our performance characteristics for radix sort quite appealing. The best case and worst case and average case time complexity is linear. It's big O of D times N plus K. And that D is probably a new value you're seeing, but D refers to the number of digits, the largest number in our unsorted array, which would be four for the example we walked through where 2310 had four digits. And the space complexity again is linear because we're just dealing with the, the size of the intermediate values, which are not going to be ridiculously large. It's going to be the range of values based on how many numbers you have and the base of the number. So what what's the range of numbers you'll be sorting, which in our case will be zero to nine. So the input will be n seven values, four digits. This will be the value that we have to deal with, which would be four. And then k is base 10 numbers, so it's zero to nine. And so if you put all that together, you can see that radix sort is rather quite nice in how efficient it is. It doesn't care anymore about the range of numbers from smallest to largest. Those are all completely ignored. And so if you put it all together, when we go back to the N, D, and K, you'll see that the, the performance is quite nice. And the reason it's quite nice is that the three steps, the number of items you have to sort is N. It's just a bar for how long our other operations will take. The sorting subroutine is root counting sort, which runs in linear time as well and optimized linear time, with the range being the digits that exist in our base 10 world. We call counting sort of all n items once for each digit, which is D, which we're trying to sort, which is quite nice. So when we have to think about the earlier problem where we're sorting two values, one through one million, with our radix sort, our n value would be two because we're dealing with just one and one million, two values. Our k value would be 10, numbers zero through nine, and our D value would be seven, the length of the digits in the largest number which is very nice because at no point are we going to be iterating through 1 million items. We're just going to be dealing with at most a largest value here, which would be 10 from base number zero to nine. Second would be the seven. And of course the n value of two. And that makes radix sort quite a nice algorithm. Now to learn about how to build radix sort, how to write it, I have a few versions that I've created, both simple and complex that you can find on group.com. Just search for radix sort on Google and you'll get there very quickly. And that gives you the JavaScript equivalent of it and you can use to use in your own applications. Now, radix sort, but to take it all back and summarize it is, is a better version of counting sort. With, it comes with all the speed within the side effects that had that leads to low performance. And that's pretty awesome, especially what you're sorting is positive integers. So if you have any questions, drop on the forums, formatcrow.com or I and others would be very happy to help you out with not just your radix sort questions, but anything in general about web development, programming and other data structures and algorithms topics. If you enjoyed this video, like, comment and subscribe to be notified of new videos I create, as well as let your friends and enemies know all about it. Sign up for the newsletter to be get to get bite-sized updates in your inbox on various things I often talk about, which might be the intersection of programming, design, development, and business. Follow me at group on Twitter and other social media networks for other updates in, in small form. And of course, I have a lot of books that I write on various topics, not just data structures and algorithms. So check out those topics as well in paperback, Kindle editions, physical stores, virtual stores, whatever you want to do, you know, whatever floats your boat. There's a book probably for you that's going to help. And with that, I will see you all next time.